Well, good morning, good morning. We are grateful uh, for another uh, Sunday morning we can gather together uh, to consider the Word of God uh, and to see how He wants us to live. Thanks for being with us, Pastor Damon Cunley here, and welcome to Virtual Sunday School with Brown Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, pastor Bartholomew Orr is our senior pastor. We uh, salute you uh, as you just continue to lead during this time. And for all of our Sunday School teachers and leadership, Thank you so much for uh, continuing to rightly divide uh, the word of truth. <clears throat> we have been in a series moving forward uh, for some time now, and we want to keep it going. Uh, the pandemic is still with us, and as believers, we have to be able to uh, know how to, how to navigate through everything that's happening from the pandemic, politics, politically, you name it, it is happening. And how do we continue to move forward, do the things that God has called us to do. And that's what this whole idea of moving forward. Uh, we cannot uh, be complacent. We cannot allow the things that are happening uh, in this life to keep us from being productive, from uh, dreaming big, for doing the things that God has called us to do. And so we, we have to be able to, to move forward and really push through. And our, our text today we're going to be looking at uh, is, a, is a unique text. I think it's one that uh, is very uh, 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 strongly needed uh, for this time. Uh, it applies to what we are experiencing, what we are going through uh, in this pandemic. <clears throat> so I want us to look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, <clears throat> uh, verses 7 through 10. Uh, I already know I'm not going to get through all of this. It's such a rich passage uh, here. And uh, I, I know many of my, my Sunday school folks, y'all y'all know this stuff. Y'all y'all are strong theologians. So I don't have to really work through a lot of the, you all have probably done the coursework on this as well. But uh, I think it is a, a very timely word for us because for some people, uh, the pandemic has slowed uh, us down. Uh, we have not been able to do the things that God has called us to do. We've kind of hesitated. We allowed some of these stumbling blocks to keep us from advancing and doing the things that would make us, uh, you know, succeed in life and achieve certain things. And so this text here, uh, Paul is dealing with an issue that he had, uh, something that many people would have seen as a stumbling block or something that would have hindered him from doing ministry. But yet we see uh, Paul really pressing through and pushing through. And that's our title today. It is pushing through the pain. Uh, all of us who have experienced pain are experiencing pain. We got to push through the pain. So let me just read a couple of verses here and then we'll just kind of see how, how the Lord used this time on this morning. So Second Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 through 10 reads this way. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should, should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. <laughs> oh, we, we can stop there. That's, that's a lot in it, but we're going to move on. Um, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Major um, public service announcement from Paul. He says that the pain that he had, this thorn in his side, he asked the Lord three times to take it away. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And I hope that it resonates in our minds that God's grace is sufficient for us. When we are weak, that's the moments uh, when we are strong. His, his, his strength is made perfect in, in our weakness. So um, that, that's our text today. And I'm really getting excited. Uh, this morning as I think through uh, Paul's transparency here in this tech dealing dealing with pain dealing with with pain 
Uh, Paul's not the only person who had to deal with pain. I think that there's a character uh, in this uh, wonderful movie that just came out in August that really illustrates pain in a way that uh, I've never seen pain before. Probably one of the most, uh, uh, most painful uh, emotions uh, this character had to hold within uh, himself. I, I've never, at all the movies I've seen, and I still haven't had the question asked of whether we can watch movies or not as Baptist people. I'm, I'm still watching movies until somebody tells me otherwise. But uh, this, this movie came out on Netflix last month. We're in September, so in August. The movie's called Vivo. Uh, Vivo, it's, uh, it's an amazing animated movie. Uh, yes, it's animated, and uh, it is Evie, my daughter. It's her favorite movie right now. So uh, we have watched this movie probably 70 times. I mean, it's on constant replay uh, at the house. But Vivo, there's a character in this movie, Vivo. His name is Andres Hernandez. And, um, I mean, this, this story is, is a great story, uh, Andres and uh, his friend Vivo, who is a uh, Kikachu, a uh, little monkey, um, they sing in the marketplace there in Havana, Cuba, and that's kind of their thing. They perform for people, and um, it's, it's, it's wonderful that the music they make together uh, as they are singing and doing their deal. W wonderful movie. You have to see it. But uh, this character, Undress, he, he, he experiences some pain uh, like... We, we've never witnessed before. Uh, I, I've never noticed anyone experience this type of, of pain. Uh, as the story is, is told, and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to watch it yourself. I don't wanna give it everything away, but, but what happens in the movie is that uh, he and his friend Marta, they are making wonderful music together. Uh, they, they're, they're playing in all the different uh, clubs and, and just touring in their little local area there in Cuba, and uh, they, they have a love for each other. Uh, he never expressed his love to Marta, and uh, at the moment that he was going to express his love for her, uh, that it was just beyond music, um, she, she gets the call, she gets the breakthrough that many artists, uh, uh, even now, they, they wait for that call, that moment where they get discovered, and someone sees talent and potential in them, and, and, and so she gets this call, and uh, the night he was going to confess his love for her and try to figure out how this is going to move forward. She, she gets this call and they want her to start traveling and touring the world and become this uh, world famous singer. I mean, this is her dream. This is their dream. They, they both wanted to, to, to do this thing together, but uh, she, she was the one that was better of the two and, 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 and she had the great voice and uh, they could, you know, use her uh, more and she made money. She became famous. And, and that's at this moment he uh, swallows his his pride he does not share with Marta uh, his love uh, Marta would, would go on and uh, they would have the scene she j gets on the plane and she flies away and, and it was at this moment I mean all of our kids we just uh, we, we get to the edge of our seats we can't believe in, in such a short period of time in the movie that it's so sad I mean we are emotionally just uh, pulled in to uh, the, the deep sadness that uh, Andres feels at this moment. Uh, the fact that he's going to live without her, that she would travel and tour. And, and we, we know how long this is going to take, but as the story unfolds, it had been 60 years that they had been apart. And she is now the world famous Marta. And, 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 and she wants to reunite with him. And so he's recounting the, the stories and the tales of uh, what life was like, and, and what he does, he unveils this this song that he had written for her that he was going to give to her uh, as she would leave to go on her tour to become the famous Marta. But he didn't give it to her because he realized if, if she knew what he felt, that maybe she would not have gone out to pursue her dreams. And I, I, I mean, at this moment in the movie, we are, I mean, I mean, tears are like, at the edge of our eyeballs about to come out and 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 look here, here's the song we, we're gripped we're already kind of pulled in emotionally but this, this is what the song says to his beloved Marta he says your plane leaves in the morning soon the world will see you shine and I wish I could be with you but your journey isn't mine he says and the world will soon adore you as I learn to live without you oh can you can you feel the pain 
every melody is for you. Every song I write is about you. Uh, and, and the song goes on and on, but, but the, the words that she never got a chance to hear, uh, the, the words that he wrote, this would be the last song that, that he would write, uh, just really pulls us into the pain, this, this thorn in his flesh that he had to live with for over 60 years. Can, can you feel that pain? Uh, this pain, this thorn, undress has to live with, it's a pain that many of us, we experience ourselves. Even in our text, Paul is going to uh, discuss the pain that he had to experience and had to deal with in his life. And hopefully what we will glean from Paul and what we glean from, how do we move through the pain? How do we push through the pain? Because as we keep on living, Grandma always told me that, look, you are going to experience some trials. You're going to experience tribulation. There's going to be points in your life where you're going to want to feel like giving up because the world will crash down on you and it's going to be hurtful. There are going to be people who uh, say things about you. There are going to be folks who, who, who just kind of push you around like you're nobody. And how do you push through the pain is the question that we just want to ask you this morning as you deal with that thorn that is in your flesh. And if we're honest, all, all of us have a thorn of some type if you didn't have a thorn prior to the pandemic, the pandemic has brought about many thorns that are uh, in our sides. These thorns that we wish that God would just take away from us. This all powerful God who we serve. Why does this thorn continue to plague me? Why does this keep bothering me all of my life? All of us, if we are honest, we have to come to grips with this the reality. As long as we live in this earth, carrying around this flesh, there's going to be something that pains us, that, that, that angers us, that we wish could be taken away, that some people use as, as, as a crutch to say, I can't do this. I can't continue to, to do life. I can't go to school. I can't do this type of job. All of us have this thorn in our flesh, but yet how, how do we push through the pain? Because these thorns as we see today brings about agony. These thorns bring about anger, but these thorns, hopefully, if we get to point number three, gives us this anticipation for what God can do in our lives. Going to our text now, Paul, he says, look, he got this thorn in his flesh, keep him from being conceited. And he said, look, Lord, three times. I mean, can you imagine that Paul asking the Lord three times to take it away, but yet God does not take it away. I hope they don't scare uh, you off um, if you're kind of casually uh, reading through the scriptures. If this is your first time and you've never uh, did any church stuff before, if you're watching and but, but you know and understand the, the weight and the gravity of Paul. Paul. Paul writes the majority of the New Testament inspired by God. He writes us these wonderful epistles. He writes these uh, letters to, to, to the church at Rome. And I mean, he, he's written most of the New Testament and Paul was used mightily by God. Uh, Paul was once a Judaizer. He was somebody who was against the church, against this whole thing of Christ. Uh, God uh, meets him on Damascus Road, changes his life instantly, puts him on a, a whole new path in terms of preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul wouldn't just preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was uh, planting churches. Uh, uh, for what we know, he went on three, maybe potentially four, depending on how you uh, uh, consider uh, start and stops of trips, but three, at least missionary journeys as he was training up leaders and developing them and getting these churches started. He would move and go to the next place. He was always on the move, building leaders, building the, the new church leaders and giving them structure and and trying to help them to ex, uh, expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, uh, as disciples, Jesus tell them, I want you to be faithful. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And, and Paul is a part of this uttermost parts movement as he is expanding the kingdom of God to the ends of the then known world at this time. So Paul was not uh, just some passer buyer. Uh, in the faith. Paul was not somebody who, you know, kind of just gets in and and just kind of haphazardly goes about life. He's not lukewarm in his spirituality. I mean, pa Paul is, is, is white hot. He is flaming hot for the sake and the advancement of the gospel. And it here is the same Paul who 
It's like, Lord, take this thorn away from me. And Paul does not have his, 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 his request answered. The, 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 the pressure that he felt was painful. The pressure that you feel is painful. The, the, the pain, that thorn that he felt and experienced was painful. And likewise, the, the, the thorns that we feel, it is, it is painful. Thorns are painful, but how do we take our pressure? How do we take that pain? How do we make it purposeful is what we hope to be able to, to see in, in this text, in this lesson today. Look, thorns, thorns are going to happen. There's no way I could sit here and tell you that you would never have trouble. A passage of scripture says, look, in this life, you will have many trials, uh, many tribulations. Uh, the trials of believers are great and are many, but yet God helps us through these trials and through these pains. So it brings us to our first point, uh, 15 minutes into this study, agony. We see agony. Paul agonized over the thorn. Uh, look, look at what he says. He says, look, to keep me from being conceited, going back to verse seven, because of the greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a message of Satan to harass me. <laughs> Man, he agonized over this thorn. He, he was being harassed by whatever this issue was that he was experiencing. It, it was not uh, uh, a little bump and bruise on the arm. It wasn't uh, the fact that somebody, uh, uh, you know, threw uh, uh, some hand signals at him as he was driving on the expressway that kind of uh, gripped his attention for a, a moment. No, 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 no. This is something that is harassing him for a quite a long time, for a certain period of time. He is being harassed. He is constantly having to be faced with whatever this is, whatever the issue is. We don't know what the issue is. Uh, some people thought that maybe you know, it was um, a, a physical ailment. I mean, a thorn in the flesh, uh, just casually reading it, you would think, okay, was it some type of ailment physically that he had? Uh, and, and many scholars would kind of point to the fact that uh, Paul, he, he lived a rough life. He was preaching the gospel in places that it was outlawed. He couldn't preach there. And so if you get a chance to read through the book of Acts, uh, you can really uh, see how, how Paul his life was, I mean, he, he was a renegade. I mean, he was on the run. Um, he was thrown off cliffs. Uh, he had been left for dead. Y'all, y'all know the story about him being shipwrecked. And so, so some scholars say maybe, uh, this thorn was a physical ailment because he'd been beat up. He had been stoned. Uh, they thought he was dead. The Lord revived him. And this happened, you know, on multiple occasions. So maybe, uh, after he was thrown over that cliff, maybe, you know, he had a hip problem or maybe it was a knee or, Whatever it was, they say could it have could it have been physical, since he did talk about it being a thorn in the flesh. We, we don't know. Paul, Paul never tells us if it's physical or not. Whatever this is, it, it was harassing him. He agonized over it. Some people said maybe that it was psychological, that this thorn in the flesh was something uh, happening in his mind, and maybe Paul uh, presented to us maybe for the first time before all of the hashtags and, and all of the, the different things that, that people are, are given awareness to in terms of mental wellness and mental health that maybe Paul was experiencing some type of mental health crisis. I mean, he was on the road, on the run all the time, preaching and teaching and, and being uh, put out of towns and put out of places, having to uh, defend his apostleship. Uh, maybe it was mental. We don't know. Paul didn't tell us what it was, but whatever it was, it harassed him. He agonized over it and it hurt. That this thorn, this messenger of Satan harassed him, but it harassed him. Why? To keep him from being conceited. <laughs> uh, this is fascinating. <clears throat> so here it is. Paul, apostle, um, uh, planting churches all over the place. He's got many spiritual children that he had raised up. Uh, you can read all through his writings of how uh, he had authority, teaching and training, and in his own strength, he could boast, right? I mean, he is doing the great work of God. He is reaching people who had not been reached before, and maybe that would be something for him to boast in. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i thinking about myself. If I could be honest with you, we've been doing this now 
for over a year, so I feel like we, we can be honest with each other, right? Like, I, if, if I had half of the accomplishment that Paul had, I think I would realize, you know, maybe it was something that was done in my own strength. Maybe it was something I did. Maybe it was my brilliance or uh, the way I say things or the way I study or or how I'm, I'm, I'm kind of living my life. That if I had half of the accomplishments, if I had 20 percent of the accomplishments that Paul had, it would probably in, in my natural flesh cause me to think more highly of myself. And not think that it is the, the strength of God working within me to do the things that I'm, I'm doing. So Paul says, look, whatever the case it was, it kept me from being conceited. Maybe, maybe the thorn that you are experiencing, the pain, the trauma, whatever it is, maybe God is putting us through certain things to keep us from being conceited so that we could keep our eyes, as the author of Hebrews says, fixed on Jesus. He is the author. He is the perfecter of our faith, uh, that, that we should keep our eyes fixed upon him so that we can boast not in ourselves, but in Christ and in Christ alone. Like that's the only person we should be boasting in. It is not in our ability. It is not in our ingenuity. It is not in how smart we are. So no matter what school you went to, it don't matter what side of the tracks you grew up on. It is all about uh, us boasting in Christ and in Christ alone. So this thorn, Paul says, it kept him from being conceited. It kept him uh, pursuing passionately after God, maybe whatever those things we are experiencing, though painful, though, uh, you know, it is mysterious. We don't know why we are going through what we're going through. Maybe it is because God, God is trying to keep us humble so that we don't get in our own way, so that we don't mess something up to, uh, to bring dishonor to the name of Christ. Maybe, I'm not saying it is, but maybe uh, this whole pandemic uh, that, that has been painful, uh, to say the least. Uh, many lives have been lost. I mean, people uh, are getting sick day by day. Uh, uh, people are, are spreading propaganda on all different sides about this, this whole thing. Maybe God, God's trying to slow us down uh, and trying to get his people to, to do what he had asked us to do back in the Old Testament. He said, look, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal the land. Maybe God's trying to slow us down to get our uh, uh, agendas and our objectives back on what we're supposed to do. And that is to worship him in spirit and in truth and to make sure that he is superior in our lives. Maybe the thorn that is in your, in your flesh, that issue, that obstacle, maybe it is, it is trying to get you to make sure that uh, we remember that it is Christ and in Christ alone who, who gives us everything. Christ is our all in all. Christ is our everything. And, and, and a lot of times, if we're honest, we uh, kind of think too much of ourselves. Uh, not, not to be self-deprecating at all. I think it's great to, for us to have ambition. It's great for us to pursue things and to uh, start stuff, uh, but but when we get to the point where we feel like we're doing it in our own strength, and it's not by the the gracious hand of God, it can really get us uh, down a path that is unhealthy. So he says, "Look, this thing was in here; it was harassing me to keep me from being conceited." So he agonized over this thorn. Whatever you are agonizing over, it's okay. It's okay, but it takes us to our next point. As we're agonizing, as Paul is agonized by this thorn, it led him to anger. It led him to anger. Look what the text says, verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. <laughs> now, we're Baptist people. Uh, hopefully I can pull from Pastor Orr's uh, vernacular, and I know that the Baptist people are going to say something three times in a row that, that they're probably at this point angry. So if Paul is is Baptist. He's angry because he's asked one time, Lord, take it away. It's still their Lord, take it away. Second time, it's still their Lord, take it away. The third time. So I know by this point, Paul, Paul is uh, a little unsettled. He, he knows who he is. He knows that he is being faithful to God. And he's like, look, man, how many times I have to ask you to take this thorn, whatever it is, take it away from me because it is painful. I am agonized by it. And now it is pushing him to anger. That he 
he, he, he was angry about this, but look at what he does. He runs to God with his anger. Uh, he, he doesn't run to social media. He don't run uh, and doing these other things. He takes his anger to God. And that's what we ought to do during this pandemic as we're moving forward. That before we go and start vomiting on people and telling them all this stuff and, and, and causing more strife and causing more discord, take our anger to God. That's what Paul does. He, he took his displeasure about his situation to God. He kept going to God. He said, look, take it away. He, he knew in the power of God. He knew that God was able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything he could. Man, he knew that God uh, is a God who never fails. So he ran to God with his anger, his displeasure. And that you think that uh, someone that was that, that, was that close to, to God would get his request met. But according to our text, it, it never happened. But yet he took his anger, took his anger to God. That's what we ought to do. That anger should cause us to be productive and not, uh, it shouldn't cause us to, to crumble. Um, our pain, that anger should, should, should push us right to greatness. Uh, I think I'm back and forth. Um, you know, who, who, who's better, Kobe, LeBron, Michael Jordan? I, I guess I have to say is Michael Jordan. And, and one of the things that we learned about Michael Jordan over the pandemic in the, the great uh, series, um, The Last Dance, is that uh, as great as Michael Jordan is, uh, there, there, there's this one thing that really pushed Michael Jordan his whole career. Uh, you would think that, you know, after winning six championships, he just did that because he, you know, maybe was chasing after somebody who had 11 championships or you know, whatever the case is, gold medals. Uh, and there are many people who may try to define his greatness and try to highlight it under a certain uh, thing. But but it was one thing, if you, if you just kind of jump into his life very closely, it was one thing that really pushed him all of his career uh, to greatness. It was his anger by not making the high school team. Uh, he had the opportunity um, uh, in high school to make the team his first year trying out. He didn't make it. And that anger that he had could have done a couple of things. It could have made him just kind of go into a corner somewhere, ball up, cry, maybe find another sport or, or, or something like that, maybe go to another school. Or whatever, but yet he he used that anger to fuel him to make the team the next year, and not only make the team, but to dominate everybody. And then he took that same anger, that domination, to, to North Carolina and dominate there. And then when he gets to the NBA, the, the rest is history. But but what fueled him, and we know this because as he was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, he mentioned this whole ideal about this high school coach and how he didn't make the team. Like that bothered him. A six-time champion, Olympic gold medalist. Uh, I mean, uh, scoring champion, defensive, I mean, everything. He got all these accolades, but yet years later, uh, he, he shows us that what, what, what irked him, what pushed him, what allowed him to use his, I mean, what kept, what kept him up at night was the fact that he didn't make that team. And everything he did to push him to greatness was because he did not make that team. How could we take our anger to God and then use it productively to, to make life different for other people and for ourselves. We have to take our anger to the Lord. But then last point here, as we round third head for home, uh, we get to the last point, for two minutes left, just in, you know, regular fashion here. So look, we're okay. <laughs> uh, we see his, he agonized over his pain. This pain made him, this thorn made him angry. But then thirdly and finally, it, he had anticipation. He had anticipation. What's the anticipation? But he said to me, verse nine, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. His anticipation was that, that God's grace would be sufficient for him in all things. There would be the grace of God that would sustain him. It would be the grace of God that will uh, remind him every day that he woke up, that God put breath in his body. That it was only by God's grace. It was God's grace that was going to allow him to do the things that he needed to do. I mean, the Bible says it is in him that we live, we move, we have our being. It's by God's grace. And if God's grace is sufficient uh, for Paul, if God's grace was sufficient for the other folks in Scripture who God used mightily, that the, the reminder for us today is that God's grace is sufficient for us as well. 
questions, no matter what their thorn is, no matter what that pain that we're experiencing in life, those unanswered questions of, of why did this happen to me? Uh, and, and those things are real. Those, those pains are real. But at the end of the day, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must remind ourselves and have the anticipation that, look, God's grace is sufficient for us, that his power is made uh, his power is, is made and is shown to be perfect in our weakness. That, that when we are weak, then we are strong because it is God strengthening us. It is God uh, pushing us. It is God giving us these abilities to do the things that we're doing. It's all because his grace is sufficient. So in your sickness, you have to remember that God's grace is sufficient. For those who are looking for, for employment and you're not getting the, 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 the offers that you want, God, God's grace is sufficient for you. For the, the parent who is trying to do their best to make ends meet, to raise the kids, God's grace is sufficient for us in all things. And as we move through, as we move forward, we got to be reminded that his, 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 his grace is sufficient. That he will strengthen us in our inner being to help us get through life, get through this pandemic. God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for Paul's words. God, I pray that uh, whatever, whatever those weighty matters, those issues that, uh, that people who are watching are facing, remind them, show them tangibly, God, that your grace is sufficient, that you have not left us, that you are still with us, that in those uncertain moments that you are still a strong tower, that you are a mighty fortress, that you are faithful. That's just who you are. Thank you so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Sunday School, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Be blessed.